So we're going to get started and move the conversation along. And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk with leaders about innovative education strategies and workforce initiatives wherein you know, large employers in manufacturing, healthcare, et cetera, they work hand in hand with K through 12 and post-secondary education uh, institutions to prepare st students for fulfilling well-paid careers to ensure employers a field of qualified workers. It's a very big issue in almost every sector that I am aware of, even the sector that I work in, in the utility business. So here today, we have uh, on stage Warner Eichenbush, Chief Talent Officer for BMW of the Americas, Elizabeth Davis, President of Furman University, Mike Reardon, President and CEO of the Greenville Health System, and Jimmy Williamson, System President of South Carolina Technical College System. We have a guest moderator for this particular session, somebody that I know very well. I know a lot of you have asked me while we're here today, say, well, how the heck does a guy from the electric cooperatives end up, you know, talking to all you people? It was real simple, you know, for five years, uh, I worked for public television, public radio, South Carolina ETV. I love my current job very much, but I have no problem saying the five years I spent at ETV were the most gratifying in my professional life, hands down. Uh, I do hope that everybody in this room is a member of South Carolina ETV, and if you're not, SCETV.org, you go there and donate today to support public television, public broadcasting. You don't have to pay me for that, it's okay. This is Linda O'Brien, she's the CEO of SCETV, uh, my former boss, um, who I not only admire professionally and respect professionally greatly, but I also have a great deal of personal affection for. Uh, she is the right person, the right place at the right time to lead an institution that I believe is incredibly valuable for South Carolina. She's a trailblazer in the world of public television, the nightly business report, her baby. She was on the original program as the executive producer, got that up off the ground before there was CNBC. And I remember those days because I watched it back in college. Um, she is a wonderful lady here to talk about a subject that she knows well. Linda, thank you for being here at One South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, and um, we have missed you ever since you left ETV, and, um, but it's wonderful to be reconnecting here at this kind of event. And um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I am delighted to be here. We have an exciting panel to really continue the conversation on searching for that vibrant middle class. And for the next session, we're going to be looking at demand side pipelines, new education strategies linking people to great jobs. But before we start, I would just like to personally thank Secretary Riley for his leadership in this state that brings us together year after year for these wonderful conferences. And I don't know about you, but I leave here feeling so energized and thinking about the future of South Carolina. It's just a great state and it keeps getting better. Thanks to you and thanks to Don Gordon and Jackie Martin and the entire Riley Institute team. Um, it's just an honor to work with you all. And so, and what a, what a combination. We had the Lee brothers and Shrimp and Grits and all these brilliant minds that we're hearing from, and then four and a half hours from now, and I'm, who's counting, but four and a half hours, we're gonna have barbecue and um, oyster roast. And um, I am keeping track of the clock, not just for that, but for other reasons. And I have this, this rather new digital watch, and um, it beeps from time to time and tells me to stand up. So if I stand up <laughs> or break into exercise, you will know why. Blame it on the watch. <laughs> but we will try to keep this on time. Um, and our panelists, we are going to start um, with one round of questions, and then we'll ask for about 20 minutes questions from here. Then we're going to ask all of you to meet at your tables and think about what you've heard here and then each table to come up with one question. So we want to hear from you as well. But let's get right into the discussion. And I would just like to ask each of you, in a minute or less, to get started, what is one compelling way to link great jobs to people in South Carolina? And let's start with you, Jimmy Williamson. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question, and that's something that we think about uh, every day, and, and the one thing that keeps us up at night. Um, for us, and, and, and housing Apprenticeship Carolina, we see the, the um, advent of registered apprenticeships and now youth apprenticeships as one way to really begin to dip down into 
um, into the K-12 system and to bring those, those uh, students along to become qualified workers for these in-demand, high-paying jobs. All right. Mike Reardon, President and CEO of the Greenville Health System. Uh, so for me, it's how do I connect whatever I'm going to do to what is our strategy. So we, we have to sort of, in 2008, we came up with two big strategic thoughts for us. And, th and that was there was going to be payment reform. So whether it was Senator McCain or Senator Obama, whether you think it's Obamacare or Obamacares, we know that it was going to have to switch. So there were real workforce implications on delivering health care in a different way. And that led to our second initiative. We needed to create a new workforce so we could see the looming physician shortage. We're now in the midst of what even be, uh, may be a greater nursing shortage. So what's our view on how we're going to lean into that and sort of uh, solve those issues, sort of a, a grow your own strategy? All right, so apprenticeship strategy. Now Elizabeth Davis, president of Furman. Well, ours is uh, creating the imagination, I suppose, with the students that we educate. And certainly it would be the 18 to 22 year olds that are our primary learners on campus. We want to expose them to employers and to partnerships, internships to spark their imagination. But we also do it with the younger students, the Bridges to a Brighter Future program, the students who are uh, working toward matriculation from high school and um, graduation and then into college. And it's all about creating this imagination for what could be in the opportunities that are out there for them. So creativity and imagination. Wonderful answers here. And Werner Eichenbusch, Chief Talent Officer at BMW. Okay, thank you. Honored to be here, by the way. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to um, build on what Elizabeth said. And uh, for me, it's awareness and exposure. Um, so really, we need to bring um, at the K through 12 level, but also at the uh, university and college, uh, technical college level and community college level, um, the students and uh, the employers together. And uh, so at BMW, for example, we, we go out quite a bit into uh, middle schools, elementary schools, even high schools. Um, I just got the number. We, we attended 125 sessions uh, last year uh, at all different levels. We had uh, over 400 um, co-ops and interns, so really connecting the students with the real workforce so that everybody can make up their mind and have that imagination of what could be and what they might want to be. So awareness and education at all levels. Yes. Let's get back to the overall economy. Um, we heard from Joey Von Nessen that um, there are a lot of jobs being created. Um, South Carolina has been called the beast in the southeast because of this prowess, and yet we're also hearing that we may not be able to fill all of those jobs locally. So, Jimmy, tell us um, how you are focusing on that challenge. Well, <clears throat> as you know, the South Carolina Technical College System for over 50 years has been trying to keep that supply chain going in terms of, of having that qualified workforce ready to uh, ready to, to to take on the, uh, any, any new job that, that comes in. Um, we, we, we've been very successful with, with uh, new companies that have, that have been brought to South Carolina. BMW is a prime example. Boeing is a prime example. Um, but we have challenges out there. We've just completed a study, a workforce study, um, that was, was um, directed by the legislature. And we interviewed about 250 business leaders um, throughout South Carolina from lots of different sectors and ask them a variety of questions. Are you hiring? What are you going to be hiring? What keeps you up at night? So that we get a real feel for um, exactly what's happening. The thing that, that is most disturbing is that we are, are facing, we've had incredible uh, economic development success with 20,000 new jobs being created in this administration. Um, about 40 percent, 42 percent of those individuals who are currently working uh, specifically in manufacturing age, are age 50 and older, and so there's, there's a looming retirement. Um, in addition, um, 63 percent of all South Carolinians between the ages of 25 and 64 don't have a post-secondary credential. What are we doing to, to remedy that? We are working very closely with the Department of Education, the Department of Employment and Workforce, and with other non-traditional um, supply chain streams, uh, working, uh, trying to work creatively with the Department of Corrections, uh, with Goodwill Industries, with AARP, lots of different 
non-traditional ways of getting people into that workforce. Military, is that another Military, word? yes. Mil I'm sorry, I, I did not mean to. So um, even if you are working with them, there still has to be that step for them to go and get that job. And we know that manufacturing jobs, for example, do pay mm -hmm. very good wages. Um, Warner Eigenbusch, you've had a big hand in building the apprenticeship at BMW, the apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and why South Carolina has been a leader in this and how this helps narrow that gap. Okay. Um, so what I will say is the credit goes to our ex-president, uh, Mr. Kerscher, who, uh, who had been a plant president in Germany, then came to the plant here and looked around and said, well, where's my apprenticeship program? <laughs> Um, I have it in Germany. I know that that gives me that uh, skill set um, that, that I need on the line, uh, doing maintenance and so forth. And so he at some point um, gave, gave us, me and my team, the, the task to create something. So um, we were excited, of course. Um, what, we, what we tried to do is to really take what I felt was really strong in the German system. I actually used to be an apprentice many, many years ago, so I knew okay. what, what I was talking about. Uh, but try to really do it with, I would say, an American twist. So the, the way uh, we implemented our system was to say we really don't want a, a dead-end apprenticeship, which many of these historically had been, which led to maybe a blue-collar job, but really there was no pathway back to really advance your education. So we combined the, the uh, work element uh, where our students work 20 hours a week with the college element with three um, upstate technical and community colleges uh, so that these students uh, after two years would have both this BMW certificate uh, as an apprentice but also a degree that they could uh, use to um, really further their education if they wanted to. So it was a wonderful opportunity and um, it, it's worked very, very well. And what is the rate of people who actually join your company or go into manufacturing after this apprenticeship program? Uh, we're happy to say that the only ones that uh, did not choose to take a job with oh, BMW uh, went to a four-year degree to uh, really advance their education, um, to get a, for example, engineering degree. And we're also happy about that because we can continue to connect with them and maybe they come back with that now hands-on skill set later on, maybe as an engineer. So, um, so close to 100%. That's terrific. Elizabeth Davis, liberal, liberal arts universities across the nation are increasing opportunities for students providing experience that positions them for good jobs after graduation. What are you doing at Furman? Well, high impact practices or engaged learning, uh, what we call it, is almost a, an expectation these days. Uh, and fortunately for us, Furman has been in that space for about 20 years, realizing way back that those kinds of experiences outside the classroom, whether it's the research, our internships, or even our study abroad, can really impact um, and round out the education that students get. There's a study out, it came out a couple of years ago, uh, Gallup partnered with Purdue University and what they found was that the employees who were the most engaged at work and who also reported the highest satisfaction in life were ones who in their college uh, experience had a mentor, a faculty mentor or someone at the university who demonstrated really uh, a, a caring for them as a person and wanting them to pursue their passion. So that was one. or. Uh, the students who had had a, a curricular and a co-curricular experience that linked the academics with the real world or had engaged in some kind of project-based learning. Any one of those increased um, engagement at work and satisfaction with life outside of work. All, if you had all three, you reported the highest levels of engagement, but it turns out only 3% of the people who responded, 3% of the 30,000 respondents, had all three of those experiences. So what we want to do is to continue to enhance those experiences. Right now, about 80% of our students self-report one of those kinds of extra or co-curricular experiences that, that link up academics and real-world problem solving. And we think that's why we have a 96% 
uh, success rate out of when students graduate. Within six months, they're either in graduate school or um, employed. But that was 80%, and I want it to be 100%. <laughs> and the way that we're going to have to do that is partnerships. We can't grow our institutional capacity by always feeling like that we need to do it ourselves. And so I'm really excited about the partnership that I think Mike's going to talk about a little bit, but where Furman is an institutional partner with the Greenville Health System. And of course, you know, 35% of our students will come in wanting um, to be a health care provider. But we know that within an entire healthcare system, there are so many kinds of jobs, right? And so our goal is to integrate even more fully across the employment uh, spectrum in our partnership with, with Greenville Health. All right, so let's talk about that partnership. Great. Mike Reardon, um, we know that healthcare is now the second largest employer in, in this state, and it's one of the fastest growing employment sectors. Tell us about the partnership and also how you are keeping up with that kind of growth. Yeah, so let me start with the second one first and I'll go back to the connection with Furman and others. So the School of Medicine so, uh, uh, started in uh, 2000, just we're, our inaugural class will graduate at the end of this academic year. So we looked outward and we said the statistics are that South Carolina ranked 44th out of all the states in number per capita and number of primary care physicians. So we needed a grow your own strategy. And then embedded in that, uh, the person that was in charge of it was Dr. Spence Taylor, a DLI graduate, who as part of the application for this medical school was a process, how do we do a better job of engaging underrepresented minorities within that school of medicine? You know, so uh, rather than, uh, by the time you're recruiting for the school of medicine, uh, it's a zero-sum game. It's, it's uh, how can we grow our own? That got us into the Medical Experience Academy. So in 2010, uh, we started the MedEx Academy. 12 students, high school students. Uh, really a good, uh, diverse group of students. It is now, as of 2014, we've got uh, 160 students. We've got 455 applicants this year. They go through a, a curriculum uh, that we can uh, connect with them. For the underrepresented minorities who may traditionally not score well on standardized tests, we get engaged earlier so that there can be additional work, additional hands-on activity. Uh, Right now, 33 of our students, the first class was 50, the second class 50, 75, and now 100 will be steady state. Uh, we have 33 students that went from this MedEx Academy pipeline are now in a medical school. 13 others have gone to other medical schools. So that's the big idea for us, how we can get into the sort of the high schools and then colleges and shape them. The big bet for us is then they come back and work for us. Okay. So we're, we're seeing this across these industries. Oh, sure. Starting younger. What, how young do you start? Do you start even middle school? Yeah, I think we're going to, we'll push it down through middle, middle school. And we have other, you know, there's the lunch and learn. There are other things you can do to connect them. We'll do that. Uh, we'll get, you know, we'll, health clinics, et cetera. We'll get them in. But the, the stronger preparation where a young person say, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a doctor, we start that in high school and start getting them focused that way now. And and then tell us about this partnership. With yeah, so then, so we're, a, we're a relatively small state and a great state, uh, uh, but we, and we have great assets in this state. So let's leverage those assets. We at GHS, uh, you know, I, I have a huge appreciation for academics, but I'm not an academic, but we had great partners. Uh, so we have, we have uh, a USC, so we started the USC School of Medicine Greenville. We have Clemson, Clemson uh, helps us with our research. And then Furman, Furman helps us with the pipeline. We've created what we call a clinical university with those three primary partners. We've got great partnerships with uh, uh, Greenville Tech, with Bob Jones, with others, but we wanted to focus on those three uh, entities to help us go to the next uh, level to, uh, to sort of create and the more students. We looked at our schedule. We had 5,000 student encounters on one of our campuses. And they were just, they were, it was like students running amok. We didn't even know what was going on. So Furman is helping us put a structure around that. And then they're also connecting us to the pipeline. So certificate programs, others. Um, the, top, one, the top three uh, universities that send students to our School of Medicine is Furman. 
Uh, and if you look at the, the denominator percentage-wise, it's greater than, the, than uh, what we get from any place else. Uh, so we wanted to sort of solidify that. We're now, we've got a program starting a junior year. Let's identify these students and guarantee them admissions into the medical school. So again, connects them back to this community. It, it connects them that way. And the other part that I found very interesting, and, and ETV actually did a story about some work you were doing with first responders, which I found fascinating, sure. of, of first-year medical students talking about community connections and learning on the job. Yeah, so the first thing we do before they come in, uh, we, we uh, uh, partner the Greenville Tech, and, and we put them all through EMS school. Uh, and then we require them to go on, on runs with EMS, and, and they continue this uh, through the school year. Uh, medicine is not just the 5.3 days length of stay in the acute care setting. It's a, a physician understanding where someone is coming from and where they're going back to. It's just so much. So for some of these young men and women to be out in our communities and seeing uh, what is going on has been eye-opening for them because the vast majority come from a place of privilege. They can see what's going on, but then they can connect with the community, and it gets them focused more on, and I said earlier, our business model change. How do we focus on the health of a population rather than just the treatment of individual uh, and issues? Can I pipe in there? Because when we were looking at where our space was, granted, uh, we know how to manage undergraduates, whether it's a firm and undergraduate having an experience or partnering with other institutions across the state, um, uh, primarily the HBCUs to get, yes. again, the, the students who wouldn't have the access and opportunities. But the other space, we kept trying to figure out, okay, but what else do we do? And where is Furman's expertise? And what we realize is that we have so many faculty, you got to hear from Dr. Longish yesterday, but so many faculty who work in areas related to the social determinants yes. of health. And that's what we want to bring to this partnership as well. Our idea would be to create an institute for the advancement of community health. So we just approved a public health major last year, but the goal would be, if you could imagine 10 years from now, that institute has the gravitas and the exposure like the Riley Institute yeah. does, um, where this is really a leader in the state for thinking about with our partners, with other people from other institutions from across the state to improve the health of our community. 40% you know, of uh, someone's health is based on social determinants. It's, it's why I get excited about economic development. Let's create jobs, let's do that. The, the second or the largest sort of minor at Furman is poverty studies. How can we get that workforce Engaging in different communities in a proactive way to impact the health really sort of gets me excited. And then how are you reaching, we heard earlier in the conference about those children who are living in poverty or working poor. How are we bringing them, how are we being inclusive to bring them into, whether it's manufacturing or into the technical schools or the university? What are we doing to reach them? Well, just, and, and also to, to um, sort of piggyback on, on what has been discussed here. For every one of those physicians uh, that has graduated, there are 20 clinicians yes. that we have to be prepared to, to, to supply as well. So supporting it. Supporting mm -hmm. what they're doing and, yep. and, and to be able to fully deploy that, that, um, that partnership. Um, you know, we're, we were founded on access and affordability, and certainly the um, keeping our, our tuition at a level that it is, it is attainable. Um, lottery tuition assistance has gone a long way in being able to open up access for South Carolinians who might not have had that opportunity. A couple of the colleges have become really entrepreneurs and have, have basically started free tuition. Uh, Central Carolina that's located in Sumter just recently announced that for uh, in their four county service area, Sumter, Clarendon, Lee, and Kershaw, anyone who is enrolled um, currently as a ninth grader in, in any high school, public and private, uh, would be able to come to Central Carolina free of charge um, for two years. Um, certainly that helps that pipeline as well. Um, working with the, the, the uh, having a um, Having a coordinated and, and um, deliberate partnership with K-12 is very, very important. Um, and we continue to, to uh, hone those relationships and to figure out how we can, can, can 
work with their career and technology education centers and make that, that a seamless transition so that when they finish that secondary level, they can easily move into the post-secondary side. And, and you and bring the, up the cost. If, if, I, if okay. I may, yes. uh, just, just jump in because um, one story that, that I think to answer your question, how do we connect the two, when I was uh, privileged to be on the Dream Connectors team um, together with Greenville Hospital System, mm -hmm. Michelin, and the idea really was, um, let's go and go to uh, some Title I middle schools in Greenville County at the time and show these students uh, what possibilities are out there, whether it's healthcare, whether it's manufacturing or, uh, or something else. And to me, it was really amazing to see um, how little awareness was there, what is out there. And uh, so to, to your question, I think what's really imperative is that uh, there is a collaboration between uh, K through 12 very early on in industry um, and the career counselors and teachers to get them together uh, to really understand uh, what's out there in the world. Like um, we had as part of this, uh, we had actually before we brought the students to, to the different companies to do tours, uh, we actually had the, uh, the teachers come out. And, and when we started the BMW tour, I asked, well, who has done the BMW tour? And I think out of all the middle school teachers that we had, there were two. And so after the tour, they were just absolutely amazed about how different this place was compared to what they had imagined, you know, with all the robotics and, and the technology and what have you. So it brought a real excitement about, hey, maybe this isn't this manufacturing from way back when. Maybe this is something totally different and we can, we can talk to the students about it. And then after that, we went into the classroom to really do some kind of like manufacturing exercises with those kids. And, and regardless of uh, who it was, they were all so excited. I think you really need to paint the picture of what could be um, to really get them engaged. So really sparking that interest at, yes. at a young age. Yes. So Jimmy, you brought up the cost of education. And let's talk a bit more about that um, versus the value in the job market. And Elizabeth, is there a false dichotomy between the relevance of the technical colleges or the four-year university in terms of preparing these middle wage earners? Well, I think we should be celebrating the diversity of opportunities that mm -hmm. learners have. Uh, you heard Dr. Newman talk about pathways and creating pathways. And so instead of saying we need to have more technical technical degrees than liberal arts degrees. How about we need techno technical degrees and liberal arts? Let's create additional uh, pathways and pipelines. But um, last fall, uh, Dr. Keith Miller, who's the president of Greenville Tech and I, we uh, co-authored a piece in the uh, Greenville News talking about how our institutions together helped, uh, are helping to educate uh, the population within Greenville County, and this, there was a story that was told about a young woman who uh, got her associate's degree in a, accounting and worked for a while as an accounting clerk and then finished her accounting degree at our undergraduate evening study. So what there are degrees for which you only need two years and then are jobs for which you only need a two-year degree, but then there are other jobs where you might need that four-year degree. The interesting thing is it's not always that direction. Turns out our students who are in the pre-health realm and who have to get, say, um, clinical hours before they're able to apply to a physician assistant program, they're actually going to Greenville Tech and getting certification to be able to do the EMT work so they act actually can be paid during their internships and not have an opportunity cost of, oh, I need these hours, but I also need to make some money. So it's actually a two-way street, I think, it's a both and. Um, can I, just to, to um, chime in on, on what Elizabeth has said, it's very, very important for us in the technical sector um, for the research institutions, research universities, and, and um, institutions that are at the PhD level to produce those um, PhD nurses, for example, because we have to, or master's prepared nurses, we have to hire those people as our faculty to teach the associate degree RN program. 
They, it's a requirement, Southern Association requirement, and there is always a shortage of master's prepared nurses. So it's very, very important for those institutions to focus on creating that pipeline as well. And we're hearing from Joey Von Ness, and that is going to be the critical area in the next 30 years, right. nurses, especially registered right. nurses. So right. it really is critical. Um, I'm also wondering about how jobs are today where they change. People don't usually stay with one company. Maybe they do in manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the exception. But in many, many areas, people will move many times. And so the education and what you talked about, Elizabeth, the project-based learning, the critical thinking skills, the ability to research, uh, you may be finding yourself with a whole new job and then drawing back on these skills that you learn. And that's our goal, is to help our students to be adaptable but it can't be all just theoretical, and that's why we want to marry that up with real-world uh, experiences to where, again, maybe taking a public sociology class with Dr. Longus, where they go into a community, identify a need, working with the community, identify a solution. They may never have a job that is directly related to that uh, particular um, problem, but it's just the skills that they develop to be able to think critically and to be able to work with community partners to devise reasonable and workable solutions. And speaking of community partners, how can employers in the wider community, nonprofits, other groups, um, really make it part of workforce preparation? How can they be part of the solution? You talk about partnerships. How can we involve others in this whole process to really narrow that gap, that skills gap? Are you asking me? Okay. Yes. Um, well, I think part of it is if we think from a, from a community perspective, we all have a role to play. I, I happened to be speaking at a Rotary uh, Club not too long ago, and that was the very question I was asked. How can we help you? And I think part of it is us being in conversation and thinking that together we're going to elevate the quality of life of the community. And so you have to know those entry and exit points. How would somebody know to come to Furman and say, hey, help us solve this problem? How would Furman know how to go out to a, a particular uh, association and say, hey, we have some students who are great. Is there a way that we might work in partnership? So that's why we're actually trying to coordinate our community outreach effort so it's not such a mystery about how to engage. Yes, yeah, so one thing, so we're going through, a, a, the, those is maybe in the upstate know, a, 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 a whole process of changing our governance structure to, uh, uh, to move to a private not-for-profit. And one of the things that we're going to do is, is set up uh, an $80 million fund, uh, $4 million a year for, 10, for 20 years. Uh, and when you think of that kind of money, except for the United Way, there's no other group that will, even Hollingsworth Fund, if you, if you separate what they have to give the firm and the YMCA, which are great partners for us, uh, it'll be even larger than that. So our view is how do we leverage that $4 million with organizations that will partner or go on their own to solve issues like access to health care or, or food deserts or any of the things that will impact population health. And I think for us, sort of giving some guidance and direction and then putting some pretty significant resources around will have a, an amazing impact uh, in Greenville. And if, if I can add to it, what can companies do? Um, really be engaged. I like what Bill Barnett said this morning, don't be uneasy with the world, but with your own contribution. And, um, you know, when, whenever we go to the, to the Greenville techs of this world or what have you and say, here's a need, we have this need, um, there is a positive response. Again, we are a big employer. I understand that it's easier for us, but if you have a number of small employers through their association or through a collaboration that go to a um, technical college, um, I'm sure that, uh, that they will get a favorable response. There are a lot of opportunities. You can be engaged in boards. There are a lot of advisory boards. Uh, we have a lot of BMW associates on advisory boards working with uh, K through 12 or, or with the technical college system to say, what are the skill sets that we need tomorrow? So let's talk about how we can get them. Uh, so really, I think engagement uh, is, is the key to this. Um, you can't lean back and complain about you're not getting what, what you need in terms of a skill set when you haven't been at the table a couple of years earlier to, to voice really what your need is.
right, and that's the perfect segue, engagement. We're gonna engage you all. We would like for the next 15 minutes among yourselves at your tables to talk about the issues you've heard, talk about the whole conference, and then come up with one question out of each of your tables. And then Mark Quinn is gonna join us again and we will go around and ask questions of our panelists. Our panelists um, are going to join at some of the tables here, so if you have questions of them during the next 15 minutes, by all means, do that. And then we'll be back up here then for more from you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Your time is up. <laughs> We're looking for those, that one question that uh, you have developed from your table. And Mark Quinn is in the audience now and is going to to start off the round of questioning. So I'll throw it over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Linda. I'm gonna go here to starting at table one. It's just not because they're first, random, but you know, pretty good question here. Krista, we need you to read this question for me here. If we agree that early education is key to a brighter future for all South Carolinians, what is the strategy for creating and building a pipeline of highly effective educators? Yeah, that, that's a pretty salient question. We've talked a lot about what it takes to educate them, but also a shortage of high quality teachers. How do you recruit them, retain them, and keep them in the state, especially in low income areas? All right, Who wants to feel that one? I'll take that one. Um, well, Furman has a very strong teacher education program, and, and it's unusual to find that at a liberal arts college, but in fact, we believe that the liberal arts education coupled with the teacher education actually makes a, for a very strong teacher, and of course then we have the opportunities to engage in the community. You know, one of the things that I was starting to get a little worried about um, uh, last semester, maybe, or a year ago, but or all these rankings that come out related to, you know, you get ranked based on the salaries of the people you graduate. Okay, well, what's that going to do? It's going to drive out teacher education programs, right? Because I'm going to lose if I graduate teachers. And I think that's just such an, um, a destructive way to think about how institutions prepare the citizen, next generation of citizens. So I think some of those things we have to be careful. Now what, you know, Furman, we're really working on managing our tuition costs and raising a lot of scholarship dollars. And that's what we need to do because, um, you know, there are a lot of times where people will say, I can get an education degree cheaper somewhere else. And so our, our uh, strategy is to be sure <coughs> students get out in four years and that we can make this, um, the, the, pi the pipeway or the, the path to um, employment uh, really carefree, easy for our students. You know, I, I served on the, uh, the House Study Committee to respond to the, uh, the Supreme Court suit with the plaintiff districts, and one of the issues that, that we uncovered was um, the problem of keeping qualified teachers in those districts. It's not just a, in those districts. We found that it was statewide. There are a number of recommendations in that, in that study report uh, that I hope that the legislature will, will act on, uh, loan forgiveness, all kinds of things that, that we were recommending that need to happen uh, specifically for those impoverished areas, but certainly uh, for the state of South Carolina. It would be good for the entire state. Okay. Okay. We have uh, Russ Keller from the South Carolina Research Authority to ask a question here. Russ. Thank you. Uh, our question from our table is, in our efforts to build and sustain the manufacturing pool of candidates, how do we also ensure that the creative arts, which are critical to our entrepreneurial success, mm. don't get forgotten? Good, good. A and uh, that's a question I think that's very important for anybody that has young children. I mean, I know at our school, that's something that we volunteer through the PTO to pay extra for, because it's one of the things that has been taken out of the curriculum due to budget cuts. But you know, for our kids, we believe it's important enough for their development that we will pay for it. Not everybody can do that. How do we ensure that that stays in the public education system or is an integral part of the public education system, provided we all agree that that is indeed important to child development? Well, I think that the whole movement um, 
now with STEAM as opposed to STEM would really address that. And, and as, as we begin to think about STEAM-related curricula um, that, that have true arts integration um, and, and using uh, arts integration at the K-12 system uh, and, and giving those schools that are, that are really serious about the creative arts, giving them um, a way to assess the, the um, achievement in that area. It's very, it's very, sometimes very difficult to assess where they are in terms of achievement. Um, and that, I think that's one way. How important it is to you at BMW, for example, to have a well-rounded person who has an arts background? I, I was actually going to, and, and, and let me um, also include um, language in, in the arts for, for that perspective. We have uh, really had a lot of discussion with uh, Clemson, other institutions uh, in an out of state, uh, how important it is for us that we have uh, an engineer kind of like as a, as a whole person. I mean, I cannot tell you how many interviews I have set in. No, seriously. Um, I mean, I. We created this, this fresh graduate trainee program, and uh, so we, we interview, uh, for the most part, people uh, graduating with a bachelor's degree, and you have people with a 4.0 GPA, and then you get them into an interview session, and you ask them some critical questions, and they are lost. And, and I've sat there and said, I have a daughter in college, I said, you know, we should really go back to those institutions and say, you need to better do a better job to pre um, prepare these folks for the real life. And so for us, what's important is that in addition, and we make that known loudly, repeatedly, that for, uh, for us it is important that it's, that it's not only solving differential equations, but that you have the right communication skills, you have the right team right. skills, and ideally, you have a foreign language or at least a baseline of a foreign language. I mean, if I can find for BMW, for example, a mechanical engineer, um, ideally a female, ideally a minority who speaks also German, I mean, you can, you can get your <laughs> dream job, I mean, right? I mean, so, so that is the truth. So, um, so that's how we uh, communicate that. For, for me, as somebody who had the benefit of uh, learning English as a second language when I grew up in Germany, starting in fifth grade, now I think in Germany they start in the third grade. Um, um, for me, it was really disappointing when my daughter started um, that she did not um, have a second language all the way through from, uh, let's say, the um, you know, third grade or what have you, all the way through. She did a little bit of German that she did in high school, I think, for three semesters, which I think is the state requirement. I don't remember whether it was three semesters, three years, whatever. Uh, but it's too late at that point. At that point, you really have to learn the language. You don't absorb it anymore. Um, so we, uh, we communicate that as best and often as we can. We are back here, deep in the corner, table 30. Juana has a question, and it's kind of an age-old question that we've been talking about in public policy circles for many, many years. In some ways, goes back to that old phrase, uh, derisive, uh, really minimally adequate education. Juana? Two, two part question, um, how do we get to the point where everyone is able to experience the positive impact of the growing economic development here in the state rather than just those who are lucky enough to live in the right locations? Uh, the second part of the question, um, how do we think more positively and honestly about opportunity and access for all and not just some? So, so let me, th um maybe address that. When I talked about when we saw how we we're going to take care of people differently, it became pretty clear to us that access is really important. And, and, in, and in medicine and others, there's a real tendency and an openness. You know, when I grew up, I, my family went to the Irish doctor in New Jersey, you know, or there was the Italian doctor. So as we looked around, you know, where is a representative sort of mosaic within our community where someone could be comfortable going to uh, a group that may have an African-American uh, physician in there if they happen to be African-American or something like that. So that was really important for us because we know that there's a higher tendency for people to access care if there is someone there that has a familiarity or looks like them culturally. So having said that, that's what helped develop our thinking 
through the DLI program, what we're trying to do with uh, MedEx Academy, to really cultivating underrepresented minorities. It wasn't for me a, a feel-good strategy. It was a strategy that would impact access because ultimately we're going to be paid on how the entire population is healthy. Uh, so we needed to have a broader base of practitioners that mirrored the community. So I don't know if that answers it, but that, that was certainly a thinking that, that we had. All right, table 16. Where's Jimmy? Or Stuart, I should say. Stuart, if you would. All it's right. your turn, sir. Right. Hey, you can have that. Thank you. It's really a challenge. It really is a challenge <coughs> rather than a question. Um, one of the issues that we know is that children, students in middle school, high school, and even when they start college, have no idea of the enormous amount and types of jobs that are available to them. So the challenge to the manufacturing and to the entire employees, employers in the United States, is create a 20 second videotape of every single job that you have and make that library available on the, on the web to every single teacher. So starting in third grade, every one teacher who t teaches a new subject can show a video that might be relevant to that subject so that the students might become intrinsically motivated to pursue their education and to pursue something which they didn't even know would be exciting until they saw it. So it's more of a challenge than a question. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> uh, I'll direct some of that to Linda, because Linda, education, ETV, the direct line to the teachers in the classroom does an awful lot of that already. Streamline. Yes, Streamline and knowall.org with a, a special sequence called Career Isle, where we actually interview uh, people in business um, specifically for students. Um, but certainly we need to do more and our challenge is how to reach everyone. We reach the schools, it's available, but how do you really let them know? And I think that's important. And another question that came up at my table was these great programs that you all are talking about, how do we let the whole state know about those programs as well so that they can replicate them in various communities? So I do think there's a role for media for education. Um, certainly we need to do our part, others as well, and certainly what is happening right here in this room is increasing that knowledge um, so that we can learn about effective programs throughout the state. All right, we're at table number nine, and Tom has a question for the group. Uh, this is one on resource uh, resources. Uh, we see that, um, and let me read it, um, how are we involved in the county school districts in solving the quality issue in education in lower SES areas, given, as an example, the PTAs are so strong on our east side and the places where we have higher SES families? Um, I see this even on the board that I serve on a charter school board. We get half the payment, the programs, in a lower SES area. It's too bad we don't have a school district person here. Any answers mm. to that one? Not really. You, you yeah, so I'll dive into, into that. <laughs> so, you know, so, and I know Tom. Uh, so I, for us, uh, how do we leverage that? So you, know, you, you have your passion where you're going into different communities. And, and our view is what can we do to go in and, and sort of give a resource? So whether it's nursing on site or uh, a practice or what we're doing now is putting people into communities. So uh, you, you think about we can map and we have mapped everybody that comes into our emergency room uh, multiple times. We looked at 61 patients in the course of a year, 1,000 visits just for those 61. They correlate to neighborhoods. So our view was, how do we wrap our arms around a neighborhood? How do we get workers to go in there and sort of partner? Is it it's the mobile clinics? How do we get our mobile clinic now to go into those areas to sort of bolster up the school system that way and sort of bring what we can bring to it to sort of make it a more stable uh, area. So it doesn't directly address you, but for me, give me a crack and we'll figure out a way to sort of support something like that because it, it helps us. We have one final question. It comes from table 15 and Jennifer. And, and this is an important question because I've had a lot of people ask, you know, how do we get involved? How does my organization do something? It's not always as straightforward as you might think when you go to the school district and say, 
my company wants to help. Well, surely you think, okay, sure, sign up. Always not that easy, but your question. So we had quite a few questions at uh, this table. We want to thank the panel for a really engaging discussion. Um, the question that really came out for us was, you know, how do small businesses, uh, not just the larger, you know, larger pipeline sort of businesses, how do small businesses support and get involved in workforce development? Great question, because that speaks to what Joey Von Essen said earlier, how we need all these companies, these clusters, and small businesses are a great jobs generator. Well, certainly um, for, um, for many small businesses, one option might be to consider um, a registered apprenticeship program, um, that, because that's not limited to size in terms, they can have one apprentice or 10,000 apprentices. Um, and, and our consultants uh, will work individually, one-on-one, -on -one with any company uh, to try to develop that, uh, that apprenticeship model uh, free of charge. And so all they have to do is, is just give a call to the, uh, to the local technical college or to the system office in Columbia or go to our website, and we will connect a consultant to that small business owner. Uh, one idea that I would have is, is use uh, an organization like the Chamber, yeah. w where you have a lot of uh, companies, big and small, come together. And I think if you get a certain critical mass uh, and get some support, um, then it would be easy even maybe um, for the Chamber on behalf of a couple of small companies uh, to go to um, your school administrators or something to say, hey, we really want to get engaged, how can we do this? Or we have some ideas. Um, you know, how can we, how can we find some, some voice in this? So uh, I would use organizations like that. Yeah, yeah so I, I would just say, have them go make jobs. Uh, that's the biggest thing that they can do, and then to connect with organizations. So w we think we're part of the economic development. We've got property right next to GHS that we're trying to leverage into a biomedical corridor uh, because of small businesses are what is going to be the driver for the economic development. So in Greenville, there's Next, that was, was a chamber initiative. Anything that I can do to help a small business create one more high or medium paying job will have a bigger impact on the health care and health status of my community than, than adding another room in the emergency room. And Elizabeth. And I was going to say, too, um, I was thinking about the Next in um, collaboration with what Werner said, but the getting together, you know, we have 2,700 students on campus and we have 240 faculty and are there things that you need to have solved? You just don't have enough boots on the ground there. So how can you almost, you know, expand your own output by relying on uh, the students that we have available? And it really goes back to understanding each other, right? You understand what the institutions in your community can provide. Um, we need to understand what the institutions and organizations in our communities need in a way that is mutually beneficial for our students and faculty and for the community. And I think it just begs that ongoing conversation. And I love the quarterback idea. You, I think communities need the quarterback to make this work. That's great. And that's really what this room is embodying, that very idea of connecting and partnerships. Thank you, panel. It You're was welcome. wonderful hearing from all of you. So Elizabeth Davis, Werner Eichenbusch, Mike Reardon, and Jimmy Williamson.